You are listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, patrons. How are you? Man, have we got an exciting interview for you, an interesting interview. Um, a lot of you may have heard of Robert Lee Hodge. He was featured in um, the book Confederates in the Attic. Um, there is a whole lot more to that, man. He's a very interesting fellow. He was born on Stonewall Jackson's 143rd birthday. Um, he uh, visited Gettysburg as a child, uh, like a lot of us have. He, uh, his first reenactment, I think he said to me on the phone, was, in, it was at Gettysburg in uh, 1981. I was three years old. And that led to a lifetime of working in Hollywood productions, like ABC's wildly popular North and South starring uh, the late uh, Patrick Swayze and uh, oh Lloyd Bridges as Jefferson Davis and I think Hal Holbrook was Lincoln uh, you know a lot of a lot of Kirstie Alley was insane um, and let's see uh, also of course he was in TNT's Gettysburg and Andersonville and his passion for the subject has uh, led him into the depths of the National Archives and Library of Congress working with nationally recognized experts like the late Brian Pohanka, Eric Wittenberg, Bill Stiepel. Um, he was the principal researcher on the Time Life Books 18-volume series Voices of the Civil War and the Illustrated History of the Civil War. And since then, he has appeared on numerous television shows on the History Channel, a and &E, uh, National Geographic Channel. He was featured on National Public Radio, NBC's Late Late Show, The Washington Post, The New Yorker, The Huffington Post, The Wall Street Journal, PBS's Going Places, and C-SPAN 2. He's won five telly awards for Civil War documentaries that he's been behind the camera on. Um, he has uh, this unique ability to combine a surprisingly high level of historical knowledge with an artist's eye. To bringing the war to life and that that is what i really liked about the guy when i was first learning about him um eric the producer had said hey um do you want to interview robert lee hodge and i said i gotta be honest i said uh who and now here's the thing i <laughs> i hadn't read confederates in the attic still haven't um not that i won't i actually own it and to quote the great michael scott read it i own it and um but unfortunately we don't read through osmosis or you know simply just by having the book so i haven't i haven't read it yet i, I hadn't heard of him before but as immediately when i started researching him i said wow this guy is uh He's something. And then, of course, I realized as I was learning about him, I had inadvertently heard about him. I had seen his work. I had, um, well, I mean, he's in the movie Gettysburg and he's, there's, that's one, one of the best lit shots, I think, uh, is, is, uh, his shot. And, um, Anyway, so so I'm like, wow, this guy's interesting. And I have to tip my hat to uh, Keith Harris, the rogue historian, who's also going to be on uh, this uh, podcast. Um, I He did an interview with him, I think it was last July. So go back and check that out. And um, it was it was very well done. And I, and I got to say that I don't listen to other people's podcasts. So to have, like, actually, like, I said, okay, well, it's Keith. Like, Keith's a buddy of mine. I'll, I'll listen to it, um, but I'm only going to listen to five minutes because I, I don't want to listen to the whole thing and then just have it be a repeat of Keith's interview. I don't want to do that. Uh, but but uh, Robert was so fascinating to listen to. I actually ended up listening to the whole thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, whatever. You know, it, it is what it is. It's I just did it. And, and, and so what? But. I spoke with Robert on the phone early in the afternoon, um, a few hours before we were going to record to kind of just get a little, uh, uh, you know, unguarded time with him and just kind of get a feel for each other. And, and my hunch was correct. We, we, we are, we kind of think the same way 
um, on a lot of different things. Um, we're, we're kind of wired the same way in a way we're kind of hippies, which is a weird thing to be in the history world, especially when you're talking about destructive war, but we, we approach it with a spiritual approach. Um, and a lot of it comes out in our works, or at least in my case, I try for a lot of it to come out in the work. Um, and I'm talking mainly in the narrative episodes there. Um, Anyway, this, this conversation, I basically started it with him and I said, uh, all right, well, we'll start this and we'll, uh, uh, you know, we'll warm up for a couple of minutes and then I'll, I'll introduce you. And then that'll be the actual start of the show. I don't know when it is 20, 45 minutes into the whole thing. I don't know how far it is, but you'll hear me say to him, you know what? Um, forget the intro. I'll record it later. Let's just keep going. So really what you're listening to is our warm up. And, um, I just kind of like blended it into the show and I could have edited that part out. So it made it sound like it was seamless and everything like that. But as patrons, you get to kind of see the the blemishes a little bit more, um, and a little bit of a peek behind the scenes of how things are done. And so I don't mind doing that with you. So anyway, um, Robert's done a lot of other things too. He's organized battlefield preservation fundraisers that have garnered over $160,000 for the purchase of endangered battlefield land. He serves on the board of directors of the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust, which uh, I believe I follow them on Instagram. You should too. Um, he has written for the Washington Post, the Nashville, Tennessee, uh, the, sorry, the Nashville, Tennessean, uh, America's Civil War Magazine, History.net, the Civil War Times Illustrated. And more recently, he was featured on the National Geographic Channel, Time Magazine, and writing on the Civil War for the Washington Post. Um, he continues to work on his films, giving tours of battlefields, writing, and speaking of across the country. And most recently, he has graced us with his presence on Addressing Gettysburg. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to you. Oh, except for one thing. If you are among the homeschoolers who use Addressing Gettysburg as a tool for your kids, I know we have a few out there in the audience. I I would recommend you not let them listen to this one. It, it We get into adult term, uh, conversations and, um, uh, subject matter regarding soldiers and their behavior and things like that. And, um, letters that they wrote and that we've read. And I would, I would strongly urge you to just pretend that this one doesn't exist for the sake of the children, unless you let your kids listen to all that stuff. That's up to you, of course. But if that's a concern of yours, then by all means, uh, skip over this one. Otherwise, I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy listening to Robert Lee Hodge as much as I enjoyed speaking with Robert Lee Hodge. And here he is. Then I can talk about this on the, when we, when we do the uh, formal interview, I guess. We're we're rolling now. I I I forgot to tell you. I always always start rolling, but I don't start the show, but I, but sometimes you get great stuff in the warm up. So I just... Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You let it roll. Yep. Um, but captain God, um, was great. And there's a great photo of him. I took on this covered bridge at Billy Creek, Indiana. And from that photo, I painted it in high school and I won best of show for my congressional district. I got to meet Tip O'Neill and, um, and, uh, actually did I meet him? He was there, but I think I was late. But he was there, Claude Pepper and some other big senators were there hanging out with my congressman, uh-huh. but uh, dealing with D.C. traffic. But, um, but with that painting, that Civil War painting hanging in the Congressional Office Building, the Longworth Building for a year, um, that narrowed my direction in, uh, after high school. I was thinking of the military. Um, but I had a collapsed lung when I was 18 and I almost died. Uh. Um, and so after that, the uh, military said, basically don't call us, we'll call you. (laughs) And, uh, so then I went to Kent state and, uh, took art classes and was very frustrated with my professors who were into a lot of modern art, abstract art. And, um, I liked Winslow Homer. You know, that, that's what fueled yep. me in the, in the congressional art award that I got. <clears throat> and I have a photo of it with, uh, my Congressman Donald Pease and the, the, the people that funded this 
congressional event, which was GM. And so I have a photo with Roger Smith of Roger in me fame. I was oh. actually with Roger Smith. Oh, okay. Um, and my con- congressman, because he was sponsoring it and he was rubbing elbows with all these senators. And I, I was just some, you know, plebe there, but, uh, but it was cool. And, um, and so getting that award <clears throat> and meeting these people, um, fueled me to want to do representational art, 19th century art, or even really the Dutch masters, the Flemish artists, uh, Rembrandt okay. and, and yeah. that school. They're great. I, I love the, the Flemish. Yeah. The Flemish artists are dynamite. And so I was impressed. That's what I was looking for, but that was hard to find in school because so many of your teachers were into uh, Jackson Pollock and things like that, that I try to, understand but it's not me no and so to find that connection with teachers was hard and um i had a teacher that said when he looked at one of my representational pieces of a civil war pistol um he said this is cornball illustrative bullshit (laughs) and this is in front of the critique in front of my all my peers you know and hearing it and so it was like a machine gun you know firing squad all every time because i wasn't into that what the, the a lot of the teachers were into I was into representational art of another century and so I was a fish out of water yeah and so I didn't do I didn't excel um, I I made a killer wall mural of rock and roll bands in my um, in my dorm room which is actually encapsulated under paint now. It still exists in room 354 <laughs> at Dunbar Hall but nobody knows <laughs> and I have photos of it man. That's awesome. So, so it could be resurrected and it could become a museum, you know, <laughs> yeah. at some point, you know, this is where I smoked pot or yeah. something, you know? <laughs> Right, but, right. But it was, um, it was a, it was a hard experience at school. I was, I was lonely, um, in art and, uh, I didn't, I had no business being in college. I was just trying to figure out who I was. Yeah. The only saving grace I thought of college was uh, the summers going to the 125th reenactment. <laughs> Those were really fun. <laughs> and I, I took some friends of mine from college with me to the 125th Shiloh, and it was 18 degrees out on a Friday night. Ugh. And he was a cool guy, and and uh, and he had never done anything like this before. And so I felt really bad because he was freezing his behind off, and. Um, he, he asked politely, he said, so why do you do this? And I was thinking, man, I, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know why I do it. You know, I, I don't have a sound bite, a bullet point for it, yeah. but, um, you know, it's a lot of things. It's escapism. Um, right. right. There's a boy scout aspect to it. Sure. Um, it's, it's, uh, the male bonding thing. Um, you know, uh, and there's females there too, but it's mostly guys. And, um, and I, I like hanging out with my buddies around the campfire, telling off color jokes, uh, sharing accounts. Um, and some of the best primary source information I've ever received is almost continually from civil war reenactments or events of that ilk. Okay. And, um, and so there, there's one reason you go to those things because you're, you're, you're getting, I mean, when I worked at Time Life Books as a principal researcher in the nineties, which was, you know, dream come true. I, I would forget to fill in my time card because I was like, Oh yeah, I'm working. Yeah. You no, know, I forgot. That's the best. Um, I had all night pass to the building. Me and the guards were the only people there. And I'd order pizza and we'd eat pizza. And then I'd go up and crank Confederate veteran on microfilm till five in the morning. <laughs> um, and it was a dream come true. Uh, you know, this is circa 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. And, um, you know, yeah, I just couldn't believe what I was doing. And it was due to Brian Pohanka, who was my mentor. Right. Um, who got me that job, you know, it was due to him and, you know, to get, I got to give credit where it's due, but Brian, when I moved to Alexandria, we had a kinship and for a long time, you know, I'm proud to say that we shared a lot of long phone conversations about, um, preservation, uh, you know, battlefield accounts, um, film, um, and Brian and I were working on a script, 
1864 Overland campaign script that um, I don't want to talk too much about. Hello, Gettys Nerds. It's Matt, and I hope you enjoyed that preview of our premium content that can now be found over at Patreon.com. I just want to let you know that Addressing Gettysburg will always have free content for you to listen to in the forms of our narrative episodes like Antietam to Chancellorsville and the upcoming episode entitled Invasion, June 1863, appendix episodes, and our wildly popular Ask a Gettysburg Guide episodes. But episodes like Antietam to Chancellorsville take months to produce as things are now. I hear from people almost every day asking how long until the next episode is finished. And the answer is, when I have the time, I can do it. Your support at Patreon can cut down the time it takes to produce an episode by months. Maybe you don't care about that. Maybe the Ask a Gettysburg Guide episodes are what you like, but they leave you wanting to learn more. Fear not. More is what Patreon is all about. Patrons receive access to new premium episodes each week. These episodes are straight interviews or discussions with licensed battlefield guides, rangers, local historians, academics, authors, public historians, people from the Gettysburg community who do impressive things, and frankly, just about anyone who can talk on a subject related to Gettysburg. I want to make sure that the interest you already have in Gettysburg is enriched with our premium content. Your support means the world to me, because that means it will be easier to produce content that will bring Gettysburg to more people and, hopefully, more people to Gettysburg. And the podcast episodes are just the beginning. So please, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash addressing Gettysburg. And become a patron. I thank you in advance.